Hi guys, so we ended lecture on Wednesday talking about hemophilia and um, talking about what that looks like as far as uh, having symptoms and internal bleeding and um, how that was actually dictated by a gene. And then we br briefly mentioned towards the end of lecture that um, we actually have treatment today in the form of gene therapy for hemophilia. And this is where you can isolate um, a normal gene that is healthy and um, clone it and then insert it into a vector and that vector is then going to be in the form of bone marrow and that um, that bone marrow sample taken from an affected patient um, will be infected with a retrovirus and these cells are then transfected and the patient um, once the genes are inserted back into the affected patient that patient will actually have expression of the normal gene so we do have the ability to treat hemophilia today so this um, condition has actually been around for um, all throughout history, so much so that in the Jewish Book of Religious Law, it, it states that if a woman bears two sons who die of bleeding after circumcision, that additional sons that she may bear um, does not need to be circumcised. Um, and it went on to even include sons of her sisters, um, although they said that sons of her brother could be circumcised. So even, you know, in the Talmud, um, where you're, um, which was, you know, based on events um, a long, long, long time ago, there's evidence of this inheritance pattern in hemophilia. So it shows that X-linked pattern of inheritance. All right, so switching gears really quickly, we're going to start talking about pangenesis and germ plasma theory. And Panogenesis was really one of the first concepts when, um, that tried to describe how reproduction happened. So this was developed by the ancient Greeks and um, about 520 BC and um, Almakan actually determined that semen um, came from the brain. That was his, his theory. So this led to the development of pangenesis and um, this concept actually persisted until about the 1800s and it went on to be more formalized um, in the fact that um, it was later defined that gemmules actually carry information from various parts of the body to the reproductive organs. So you have gemmules in the brain, the heart, the liver, skin cells, etc. And that all was carried to the reproductive organs and um, were passed to the embryos at conception. So um, pangenesis persisted um, in some cultures up until about the 1800s, but in earlier times, specifically Aristotle's time, Aristotle actually rejected pangenesis, and he believed that both females and males um, made contributions to the offspring. And somehow there was some sort of struggle between those different traits, and that's why you had an offspring that looked more like mom or acted more like dad, etc., so um, other theories that were out there was this concept of preformationism, pre and um, this was very popular around the 1600s, and this is where all of the traits in an individual actually came from one parent. There was no contribution of the other parent. And another theory was where um, an offspring was actually a homunculus, and this is a, a tiny baby that is preformed. So basically, it's 100% developed. All of the um, organs and stuff are just very, very small. And that homunculus actually um, exists within a sperm or an egg cell. And throughout time, there are also... Um, split into two camps of belief, the ovists and the spermists. Ovists obviously believed that the homunculus resided inside the egg, where the spermist argued that it was in the sperm. All right, so let's uh, now start talking about the father of genetics, which is Gregor Mendel. Um, and he developed um, the basic principles of heredity, but those principles in his work was really based on some earlier work done by um, Joseph Krolltner in about 1800. But um, Mendel actually had the means and carried out the experiments. So he did the science. He didn't just uh, theorize what was happening. 
So a lot of Mendel's theories really led to some of the cell or the discoveries that we know of today, such as cell theory, the structures of the cell, um, and then um, some of the Darwinism concepts um, that he wrote about in his book, The Origin of the Species in 1856. So all of these genetic components have really shaped our food industry that we have today. So we now have crops um, that are higher yielding because we've strategically bred for certain traits. That we have um, crops that are disease resistant, pest resistant, and enriched in nutritional value. So um, one of the most famous ones in agriculture happened in 1970, actually throughout the late 60s, where Dr. Borlaug actually received the Nobel Prize for developing a hybrid variety of rice. So biotechnology um, is, is really um, capturing a lot of the genetic technology and has offered um, genetics um, or genetic concepts in very new ways. So specifically, our ability to identify defective genes. So um, dystrophic diplasia um, is a really severe form of arthritis, and you can see a normal end or a normal X-ray in this top picture, and then an arthritic um, X-ray that occurs because a person has a mutated gene on chromosome five. So our us being able to use all of the past history that was um, in research and concepts that were developed in genetics to identify those defective genes helps us treat certain conditions today. So another example is um, our ability to actually study reproduction. So this picture here is um, is actually um, a fly embryo. So and it's um, dyed for two different genes. So the, the um, gray stripes and the stained brown stripes determine actually the segments of a fly larva's body or a fruit fly's body that is going to develop. So um, it, it's very cool because like one band might be, you know, a wing, another band might be an eye, um, that type of thing. So our ability to actually create stains that can attach to genes um, and be expressed is really a fairly new concept. Um, and this was first done by Peter Lawrence in 1992. All right, so um, we've also seen biotechnology happen in some of our pet species. Um, this is Cece. She was a kitten that was first cloned in 2001. And then um, other biotechnology concepts and technology that we've been able to develop over time is a lot of gene therapy. So very similar to what we talked about with hemophilia. You know, we develop a virus that contains a functional gene and we can insert it into a person, uh, most likely with bone marrow, or, um, that is going to have an, a, some sort of mal function or a symptom or a condition and they their body can then uptake that um, functional gene and start to produce a normal phenotype. So this gene therapy method was first used in 1990. Gene therapy is really um, a really phenomenal concept because it has the ability to to treat many different uh, symptoms and conditions such as um, the immune immuno um, function or dysfunction, such as the Bubble Boy. If you guys have ever seen that movie, it actually is a real thing. Uh, hemophilia, muscle dystrophy, blindness, um, a lot of cancers, and then now we're actually seeing a lot of research go into neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. So in the 20th century, um, some of the genetic benchmarks that happened was, first of all, in 1866, Mendel um, published his groundbreaking work that he had done with sweet peas. Um, that Those results were largely ignored until the early, or the early 1900s when Walter Sutton used a lot of Mendel's um, work to determine gene location on chromosomes. 
the discipline of population genetics, so looking at how a gene acts um, from generation to generation or in a population, was born in about 1930. And then um, in the 1950s, the 3D structure of DNA was, um, was actually discovered by Watson and Crick. And again, we've got from there, um, genetic discoveries get really, really frequent. So DNA was discovered in 1966. Um, recombinant DNA was made in the early 70s, then sequenced later that decade. Um, polymerase chain reaction technology, which you guys are going to learn about, um, was developed in 1983. And then, of course, gene therapy in 1990. And in 1995, we had the first genome that was fully sequenced. So the future of genetics is very, very positive and very bright, um, but again, unknown. So um, the, the ability to computerize genetic information has really led to um, a new flood of information that is coming more and more and more frequently. So let's get into, actually, we're going to stop there um, for this section and we'll pick up part two. Um, and finish up chapter one in the next um, online lecture.